Hello, everyone. We are gonna start here. Um, so uh, in this uh, coming hour, we are gonna, um, we luckily have uh, Emilio, uh, who is a research scientist at APO, who's gonna teach us about the data access with uh, IOOS system. So while I'm doing this, I can tell you that um, um, I have three notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. Um, they, I, they were updated mostly last night and um, an hour ago, or half an hour ago. So in order to have access to them, if you want to um, run them while I'm talking um, on Jupyter Hub, you'll have to follow the instructions from yesterday to do a get poll, again, from Jupyter Hub. And, uh, I wasn't paying attention, so you'll have to, um, if you need help, you'll have to ask Don or someone else. Um, now, you can also just follow along the notebooks directly. They are complete, so you can just uh, scroll if you don't want to uh, mess with running them while I'm talking. Let's see. So I'll start out with the PowerPoint um, before I get to the notebooks. Just uh... well, while Valentina is writing, I'll say that um, I use an OI share kind of acronyms that look kind of the same, uh, and that can be confusing, but uh, they are. Um, two important systems nationally, I would say, and to some extent globally, that are highly complementary. They're quite different. Um, obviously, the technology can be quite uh, pretty similar. We all have moorings and other instruments, but the way they go about um, expanding access um, to data um, in the oceans and what data is included uh, is built on different models um, of how to improve that access, how to bring more data together. And again, I think they are nicely complementary models in that they cover the, uh, together, they cover uh, a wide swath of what exists and, and what the needs are in the broader community, both scientific and societal. Um, I am the, as you heard yesterday, um, if you remember, I'm the data management lead uh, for NANUS, the Pacific Northwest Regional Association for NANUS, so based here. Um, and um, this presentation is mostly swiped from um, people at the IOS program office. I just adapted it. And uh, you heard yesterday that we have a bunch of um, IOS uh, people here. Jen Bosch is kind of an IOS uh, person. Oh, yes, she, she's now left for another position. Then we have a couple of people from different regional associations. Um, so as we launch forward, if any of this is of interest to you, um, We'll have people who can answer your questions. Okay. So I started uh, talking a bit about this. Um, I use this a federal program uh, that is run off of NOAA, but it's uh, um, it's formally defined by an act of Congress. Uh, and again, Jen. Yeah, uh, acronyms, rules, etc. But it's highly formal. It's what I uh, what I wanted to emphasize, and. Um, Unlike IUS, it's not a single uh, self-contained entity. It's really a, a network of networks and a collaboration across the board that wants to co collaborate and collaborate and leverage and leverage. Uh, formally, though, it, it's built up of, or it's made up of this uh, program office that is fairly small um, up in Silver Spring. Yeah, in Silver Spring. And um, partnerships with other federal agencies, both within NOAA as well as other uh, federal agencies like USGS, um, all of whom would have uh, monitoring programs, for example, tide gauges from the NOAA, the, the appropriate NOAA sub-agency or agency, NOS, um, as well as NDBC. We have an NDBC person here somewhere, I forgot. Yeah, there you go. The mornings from NDBC. Um, 
So in other words, there is this national collaboration uh, among fe national federal agencies that is built in, part of um, IUS's mission. But another com complementary component of IUS is um, w this 11 regional associations that uh, break up all the coast, including the Great Lakes, into um, uh, subsets. So that uh, between the 11 regional associations, all coasts are covered. And that includes the Pacific Islands, um, as well as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And the idea of this complementary system is that uh, regional associations are a presence on the ground of people who are not federal um, uh, employees for the most part, although there is a great uh, collaboration. And that creates, uh, um, often creates uh, or breaks barriers uh, of distrust and creates easier collaborations, easier relationships that build bridges between all the way from small groups, um, small tribes, for example, in this part of the world, all the way to the federal uh, level. Um, so again, it is by definition a collaboration of multiple groups at multiple levels. Um, DMAC is our own acronym of uh, what otherwise would be called CI, I guess, Cyber Infrastructure, Data Management and Communications. Um, the, I'll be focusing on that aspect of IUS um, and the nuts and bolts, if you will, but uh, broadly speaking, it is the collection of the people who are involved in this, the processes that get in place and the technology that, um, that makes it happen. Um, to disseminate data, move data around, create um, consistent metadata conventions or, or adopt metadata conventions that then get implemented across the board, across this diverse network. Um, and one slide doesn't say that directly, but one fundamental um, value of IUS or mission is open data, and open data disseminated the most widely because uh, sci science is one science, if you will, or one uh, part of our mission, but it is not the only one. It is serving society, serving education, uh, serving very concrete societal needs, and certainly science as well. So uh, broad, broad uh, client base, if you will. Uh, because of this commitment to openness and commitment to supporting the different elements of that network, uh, I use invest uh, fairly heavily on the advancing this uh, interoperability standards um, uh, not necessarily inventing them unless we absolutely have to, um, but also advancing um, chunks of software that help uh, make all of this happen. Here's a small list of uh, some, oh, keep pointing there, but anyways, there is a small list of some of the software that I has either built or supported the development of or um, help uh, foster um, software to do compliance checking for adherence to these metadata standards. Um, software for, um, client software for ingesting data from different sources, for serving data in particular protocols, um, and so on. And you can find all of this goodness, plus some older software that is no longer used in, in the IUS presence on GitHub. Um, so like I mentioned, this is a distributed system, and this just gives you a brief, rough taste of what that looks like. We, we encompass forecast models as well as observations and all sorts of um, observing platforms, from moorings to uh, gliders uh, to high-frequency radar, which, is, which have antennas across the country, so it's a kind of remote sensing, um, to very simple um, like single sensor attached to a pier, and everything in between. Um, and uh, these are data from this uh, platform are served uh, via a number of protocols that have been uh, um, defined as the preferred protocol and encodings uh, by IUS over the last multiple years. And um, that in and of itself is a work in progress that is being evaluated as we go along and sort of improved as we go along. Um, but this gives you uh, a snapshot of the uh, current, sorry, I keep pointing here, but there's nothing there. There, um, this gives you a snapshot of the standards and conventions that we use and roughly the software that are key components of the IUS um, overall interoperable system and what people deploy at a different end. So for example, we have the top NetCDF and CF conventions together with ACDD, metadata for discovery, um, um, as well as the IUS SOS slash three, so it's from the OGC family of sensors, uh, profile for observation data. And uh, the threads a server that was already mentioned in the previous talk, ERDAP, um, the, I, the IUS 52 North SOS server, um, Threat server has different plugins that, that provides data or makes data accessible in a number of different uh, standards uh, for different purposes. And all of that, again, is, be, is accessible via this uh, um, 
protocols like OpenDAP or StableDAP, MerDAP. Um, I won't dwell on this, but this is a, 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 sum, a brief summary of uh, some of that core software. Um, obviously, this presentation will be available to you. The idea is that everything we're doing here and saying becomes a resource to you both for this week and later on. So there are links in there to all of this uh, um, plugins or software. Um, so taking a different view, what that uh, inter interoperable system looks like, a slightly more detailed view, uh, we have um, for data discovery, we have um, uh, mechanisms or a system that um, takes uh, metadata and um, and service the service endpoints that are defined for the different servers out there and integrates them and facilitates discovery. So you can start on the upper left with uh, a thread server that is with data sets that are following this set of standards, NetCDF, CF, and ACDD. Um, and um, a plugin called NCISO, for example, that I use has help support that transforms each of the data sets in the thread server into ISO 19115.2 XML metadata, and that's a widely used uh, um, metadata standard from ISO. Um, and likewise, from ERDAP um, or from the uh, 52 North um, IUS pro uh, flavor of the, ser of the server, there are other tools that uh, transform the internal storage and internal metadata into ISO 1915. All of that gets harvested by the CCAN catalog. Well, all of those get registered in the registry. They get harvested into uh, the CCAN um, catalog. CCAN is a pretty widely used um, generic uh, catalog software. And that becomes the, uh, together with this uh, Pi CSW, which adds geospatial goodness uh, for querying, that becomes the central point that integrates all these distributed systems and the metadata and data sets from across the border, across the system, um, and, and allows a user or a machine to uh, make, quer make queries, to request um, data sets, or, or more to the point, to request uh, information about where to find different data uh, so that you can then um, identify the service endpoint and interact with it. And here are just examples of, um, because these are all uh, well-known uh, service, uh, web service, web service types, uh, we have software like QGIS for GIS that can consume CSW to do a query, or you can do um, uh, programmatic access like Python CSW client, which is what we'll do today. Um, the IS catalog, well, there's a user application out there. Um, I won't be going to it, but you can. That's the link. Um, so it has this um, um, human-friendly uh, component where you can um, enter criteria and um, find products and browse. Uh, but also behind the scenes, like I said, there is an API or two uh, that are intended for machine-to-machine -machine access and querying. Um, this is another uh, somewhat more detailed view of that IS catalog. Um, on the left, you have um, a listing of potential providers in multiple regional associations. Uh, I guess one thing that's, well, well, maybe at the end it's listed that all the individual national agencies that are individual providers as well that may have a wealth of data from their monitoring program and I've highlighted in red um, resources that are um, another aspect of IUS. In addition to this uh, uh, geographical division into regions, there's also a model of what's called the functional or thematic DACs, or data assembly centers, um, that have put additional effort into particular data types that are distinctive. And the, uh, I think there are three or four DACs. The two that... Uh, um, come to mind and that I'm highlighted here are the Glider DAC, you've heard about it today, and I'll have a notebook that uh, um, explores it in more detail, um, that serves as a central aggregation point and distribution point for Glider data from all sources. Um, another one is the High Frequency Radar DAC, um, and I won't, get, won't go into that so much. Um, again, from those catalogs that uh, CCAN slash ICSW, um, other catalogs can query directly via machine-to-machine -machine interactions, or other users can query, um, or other applications. In this case, we're showing in the bottom right some national-level integration user applications that IS has developed to, uh, at some level, to demonstrate this capability, at another level, for them to be useful tools in and of themselves. Um, IUS is also, I forget the lingo, but Dan can get it right. It is the national contribution to global um, 
ocean observing system, something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> so in that sense, um, there are connections from all these aggregation efforts nationally to these uh, global uh, programs like GOOSE and JCOM and GEO. I won't say anything else about that. Um, I won't dwell on this. Uh, this is just to give you a, a flavor of some of the uh, um, standards and conventions that go uh, that we adopt and use heavily. Some of these um, you've already seen in the previous uh, presentation, like an FCDF with CF conventions. And this is just a brief summary of uh, the structure of NetCDF files and uh, a little bit about CF. Um, again, um, a brief summary of uh, CF uh, structures, uh, metadata structures. Um, I'm not sure that uh, ACDD was mentioned before, and, and you don't need to worry too much about it, but it's another layer of uh, uh, metadata conventions that are, uh, we didn't invent it, but we helped strengthen it um, because it was complemented or filled the gaps in CF in terms of discoverability of data sets. Um, so um, when you put all of that together, you start with data sets with the NetCDF files that have been uh, nicely structured with, and they've been added with uh, or enhanced with CF uh, compliant metadata and structures, as well as ADDD, ACDD, and all of that together with the structure of data flows into the, um, in this case from threads via NCISO into the metadata records that you see on the IUS catalog, as well as the re um, metadata that you can query via um, an API. Um, and this gives you a very tiny and narrow example of part of that metadata, and we'll explore this some more in the notebook, both the strengths and the challenges that remain that defining a web service types, uh, what a web service type, whether an endpoint, a URL, is an open DAP uh, endpoint, or whether it's an SOS, get observation endpoint, it is that the, the um, the level of agreement in the community is still a bit in flux, how to define it properly, both how to do it properly, and also uh, it's one thing to come to agreement somewhere in a community of, or, or a community aggregation of a few people, it's another one to have it widely deployed so that, um, um, and so that it's widely and consistently available. Um, as you'll see in the notebook, that level of agreement and implementation is still in a bit of flux and hopefully moving towards convergence. But anyways, once we come to that agreement, and this is a community process, it's not something that is imposed by one group from above. Um, you, you see on the left the uh, um, ISO 19115 metadata, the appropriate place where uh, this well-recognized label or well-accepted label would be used, and that, that would propagate to its usage in the catalog and in client software that consumes it. Um, we have a wealth of documentation. Most of it is up to date, I think, or kept up to date. Um, I won't delve on any of, it, any of these, but um, you, you see that one uh, for um, documentation portal, um, asset identifier conventions. I failed to emphasize earlier on the one place, if you have to remember one URL, it's a simple one. It's ius.us. Um, you can check it out later. Jen will say more about it, but that's for, for us in this audience. Um, it, it is the most useful link that, that you can uh, remember. One um, uh, software that I use developed also, um, and pretty much everything that I use supports, or almost everything, is open source. Oh, sorry, that was my um, key to ending the presentation. Um, is the compliance checker. And this is a pretty flexible tool that includes uh, components to um, allow a user, so someone who's creating data, to check various aspects of the compliance of your data, your NetCDF files or other types, with different um, standards for CF conventions, for example, different versions, CF standard names, uh, ACDD, and so on. It's a very useful tool. I believe um, it's based on Python, so you can run up, download it and run it on the cell against your data, and it gives you an assessment of how well uh, you're complying with the standards that you're trying to comply with. There's also a web tool um, that um, Jen can probably give the link. I don't know where it is. But there's a web tool. You can upload your file, and it'll give you the same report. Um, there you go. Um, this is just one example of the national level application that I briefly mentioned earlier that um, um, 
leverages or, t or uses the, the integration of different data services or, uh, or the dis distributed data services to provide uh, national access in a user-friendly way. Um, this is called the IO sensor map, or it's one component. Um, here it's a snapshot of the uh, ERDAP instance from the glider deck. Um, and again, I'll go more into this uh, from a programmatic access perspective. Um, and because I'm from NANUS and because regional associations are one integral component, the network of regional associations are an integral component of what IOS is, just wanted to uh, give a snapshot of uh, um, how we operate, that in regional associations we serve as a bridge between local needs and local stakeholders and national uh, levels. So we, we suck data from national uh, data streams. We also expose uh, local data streams that may not otherwise be discoverable or available nationally, for example, this, that's in my role. We work with tribes here that don't have extra resources, but as long as they're willing to work with us, we take their data and uh, transform them into this uh, interoperable data streams and connect them nationally, uh, and then plug them into our own applications. Um, so just uh, as an example here, I am uh, showing um, in the map, you're seeing a model that is um, a ROMS model uh, from Oregon State University. I, this is, uh, I can't read what I'm seeing here, salinity and currents. Um, this is supported by NANUS, th and therefore from IUS. Um, we integrate it into this application to support our local users, but we also push it on to, uh, uh, for interoperable access to the uh, IUS system. And um, the pop-up that you're seeing on the right and the time series uh, that you've seen down below is from an OI mooring um, because the endurance array is so important to us regionally. We make an extra effort, thanks to Craig Rizin and others, uh, to um, be able to integrate data that uh, seemed relevant and it was accessible. Um, we also, to serve our users, um, uh, try to listen to specific user communities and uh, target applications, user applications, to uh, those user communities, be they fishermen, boaters, um, um, more recently, surfers, um, so that you don't overwhelm everyone with the same huge amount of heterogeneous data and rather present more uh, narrower views that are targeted to what we heard from them that they're interested in. Um, for you to go back to if you find any useful links in there. And I will jump to these notebooks. Um, you, I'm not going to use uh, Jupyter Hub directly uh, just because uh, that can often slow things down. However, you can. The, um, if you've already um, updated or done the pull, um, the get pull or get fetch. Um, you have the updated notebook. You can you should go to day two, I use access, and the notebooks are there. What I'm going to do, um, again, for simplicity, is I'm going to present the rendered notebooks and walk through them um, and explain what's going on. Again, you can try to uh, be running them at the same time. That's up to you. Or you can be running them where I'm, or, or stepping through them uh, where I'm doing that. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that uh, I probably have more stuff here than you can absorb uh, in this time. And that's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry if you don't understand every single thing. It, it, it's fairly complex. The idea is here is that we're providing resources for you to chew on that can help um, um, support your thinking for as you develop ideas for projects. And um, if you have any questions about any element of these notebooks or I use in general, there's a bunch of us here that, uh, that uh, you can ask. And I should have mentioned Felipe also. You've heard about Felipe before. But uh, these notebooks were probably 80% from Felipe originally, if not more. Um, so I'll, in case, I forget if this was mentioned, but um, let's see. Yeah, right. One, um, I can't do math. Um, you've heard many reasons why Jupyter notebooks are great. Um, um, one that was probably mentioned, but if not, you've seen it before uh, already, is that um, they are rendered. If you dump them in a GitHub repo, they are rendered, so you can see them. You can share that. Just by putting it in GitHub, you can point other people, and they can see it without having to run anything. That's fantastic. Um, in reality, though, GitHub doesn't render absolutely everything in a notebook. It doesn't render interactive uh, web elements. Um, so the best way to 
fully uh, share uh, um, with someone a notebook without them having to actually run it is via MB Viewer. Uh, if you're not familiar with MB Viewer, you should make sure you are. Very simple, mbviewer.jupyter.org. Um, all you have to do is dump, it, it interacts with, with uh, GitHub very nicely and simple way, so that if you have a notebook on uh, GitHub, you dump a URL or file names and it'll read them and fully render uh, the notebook the way uh, it was intended. So that's what I'll be doing. There's a listing from the repo that you should have on Jupyter Hub, same set of files. Um, so I'll start here. Um, so first we'll use um, uh, the, the IUS catalog and the CSW or the catalog service for the web from OGC uh, endpoint to make a query for observations and then drill down, explore what we get and drill down a bit. Um, I'm not gonna read everything here, but uh, um, that's the background. We'll define a spatial bounding box, a temporal, uh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess I probably need to watch this. Okay. Um, so we'll define a spatial bounding box and that'll be the endurance array, um, roughly. I don't know what the official uh, bounding box is, but it's pretty close. Um, a time span and a specific variable. And then again, we'll narrow down a bit. And in the process of getting results, we'll also expose some of the challenges that remain in this uh, world of uh, uh, interoperability and diverse systems. Um, so first is that load, load your packages. Sorry I didn't put the uh, cleanup of the warnings that uh, Twitterch mentioned. Um, so ignore those warnings. Um, so here we define the endurance array bounding box by just a simple uh, lat longs, um, but I'll turn it into, um, because we, we all, we're also here to try to impress you on how cool Python is, we'll turn this raw values into GeoPandas, a GeoPandas GeoSeries, um, so that we can reuse it uh, more flexibly. Um, so now that we have that GeoPandas GeoSeries, um, Endurance Debox GS, we use CartoPy, I think it's been used before already um, today, um, to create a simple plot, just a reference plot of um, the endurance array. I'm just using it for the endurance array. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not like. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, font's kind of small here, uh, but uh, and it's a Mac. I don't know how to. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That should be good. Um, sorry, I, I, my computer is in Ubuntu, so even funkier. Um, so, anyways, this just serves as a static reference map that you can refer back to. Um, we're in Washington. There it is. So, but you've heard about the endurance uh, array yesterday. Um, and today. So now we're going to define, we define this bounding box, um, and now we're going to define other filter elements to issue our query. Uh, first, we'll transform the spatial elements that we already had into um, this OGC filter element, an FES. And o OWS lib is a great uh, library for handling OGC web services. Uh, now we'll define our temporal uh, filter. Um, we'll, um, the, it'll be basically anything in the last five days. Five days ago to now. And then we create, create our temporal filter here. Um, now we'll query for seawater temperature. These are CF uh, standard names, but um, partly because of the origin of this uh, uh, notebook and partly uh, to make a linkage to the follow-up notebook, in reality there's more than one name here. Uh, the last three or so are tend to be used more with models, but we'll leave them in there. Um, and then the rest is sort of stock um, setup for these kinds of queries. Now we put it all together, all those different filters, the spatial, temporal um, um, words, I guess, or, or variables um, in, into a single filter, which I am, and um, deal a bit with messiness. Um, CDIP is one of these uh, functional DAX for uh, waves, um, but it's got a, weirdness right now that uh, we, we, uh, that is not working properly. So we are filtering it out so we don't get 
results that are irrelevant. And GRIB, I'm told, uh, some of you may know what that format is. I, my understanding, it's an awful format, and we don't want to mess with it. So, uh, <laughs> but some might. <laughs> she laughs. Um, so we'll just throw it out. We'll just filter it out so that we don't have to mess with it. Then, or? OK. OK, now there is the endpoint URL, and uh, we, there is the request. Um, we have so this IS tool is a helper package uh, to make things a little uh, easier. Um, again, you can be running this if you want, and it should be fairly fast. Um, I last ran this last night. It returned 26 records, and now we're going to um, make a simple uh, abbreviated list of these things. Um, and, and remember that we're uh, uh, hitting a catalog that has both models and observations, and different kinds of observations. It includes, includes gliders from the glider doc, but because we only selected the last five days, we actually didn't get any glider data uh, here. So we got a mix of uh, most of them being fixed location observation assets or platforms, um, some from NOAA agencies, uh, some from the nanosphere, so from the SOS server that I maintain, uh, which in reality it's not that nanos funds all of this. We aggregate this from different partners and then broadcast them nationally. And then a bunch of models, some regional, some national, or possibly global. Um, so we'll start exploring that. First, uh, before zooming into a particular query, I wanted to um, show a bit of what each of these uh, catalog records looks like. Um, so I picked one from uh, NOAA, from NOS, and um, ultimately um, CSW is uh, trading in XML, XML records. And it's, its primary um, record is a Dublin Core st standard uh, XML. So normally you wouldn't need to be uh, messing with that, what that looks like, but it's kind of helpful to know what, what was actually passed around. And that's, so you see some keywords, some abstracts, and some URLs that represent web endpoints, um, and uh, some spatial information. Um, okay, so now we'll try to, out of those 28 records, we'll try to narrow down to what we're interested in. And um, I'll let you read that directly, but that, that'll serve this useful background that, like I mentioned before, uh, Defining unambiguously a service type is still sort of a work in progress uh, and implementing it across the board. So in reality, we'll have to mess around a bit and make some hardwired decisions. Um, the references um, object that uh, includes those endpoints and some descriptor of those endpoints. Um, but we also use this community tool, a uh, little uh, tool called GeoLink and SniffLink, uh, or SniffLink um, module. Um, to try to get at that labeling at the same time, and then compare the two. Um, so here we compare the results of GeoLink and Steam, and unfortunately they have some divergence. Um, so you see some OG, OGC colon SOS here matches from GeoLink matches different things than the Steam results, uh, which just means that uh, we'll, um, we'll have to make some assumptions. Um, now we'll drill in to um, read all the observations that we can uh, from those 28. So A, we'll be reading the ones that uh, are observations as opposed to models that are um, from SOS, because we know in IUs that that is a service that, uh, um, by definition, in our uh, adoption, will only have observation data sets, and will only pull the ones that have uh, CSV, the text slash CSV encoding as a result, and that have also the uh, CF standard name for uh, sea water temperature. Um, and we'll modify the uh, temporal window to the last five days. And that, that results in six out of the 28 records. Now we only have six. They're all coming from one source. Um, so we do a bit more processing. We use pandas read CSV to push in the URL that represents the data service that returns the CSV. Um, and now after that step, after cell 21, we've read um, all the data, all the time series for the last five days for seawater temperature from six sites. Um, now we'll just plot, um, create some plots, some nice plots. Um, so here's one of them. Again, this happens to be um, six sites from one agency, from NOS. Uh, so they're all sort of high gauges, except that this is water temperature. Um, and now we'll map in, in a nice um, interactive map, Olium, um, and make it easier to digest. This map is, like I said, interactive. And each of the dots, so all of the locations, everything in this map got pulled from the various queries and the definition of the bounding box at the top. Um, the uh, 
plot in, in the pop-up is a bokeh plot, so it's interactive as well. Okay, um, let's go to the second one, and the second um, notebook builds on the previous one. Read next. Okay. Um, it's essentially the same scheme. We'll, we'll build the same kind of uh, CS query, CSW query, except now we're interested in models. And because we are ecumenical, um, we don't want to do just the Pacific Northwest, and now we're turning to the, the, the East Coast and the Pioneer Array. But pretty much the same steps. Uh, define the Pioneer Array. Um, define the filters. In this case, I'm doing 20 days, the last 20 days. Um, so you'll see pretty much the same kind of code. I added one piece of magic here. Um, the, um, there's a link at the top or in the first notebook that takes you to uh, a, a really useful page on the IS catalog that basically says what the IS catalog is um, as well as what it aspires to be, what shortcomings it has. Uh, one shortcoming right now is that there is no unambiguous way to separate uh, results that are model forecast versus observations. So given that limitation, and they're working on it, uh, given that limitation, I've added this filter that, uh, or I cross my finger and hope that everyone who wrote an abstract for a data service for a model put somewhere in their forecast. Could have put model, but model could mean different things. So um, as part of the query, it'll only select records that include the word forecast somewhere in there. And it turns out that was really good. People are consistent uh, in their use of language. Um, so that brings back five records, and they're all models, thank God. Um, so you can see that there's a range of models. Um, some of you may recognize this. Uh, some of you come from Rutgers, so you, if you're from Rutgers, you may recognize it, a global model. Um, we'll use the same, similar scheme to look at geolinks um, a versus scheme. And again, we have divergence so between the two. Uh, in this case, we'll, we are looking for open that services. That's our canonical web service um, access mechanism for uh, model output. Um, so we've devised um, this mechanism to um, identify um, appropriate endpoints that will then suck in. And um, the first step, we'll use the NetCDF4 data set um, to use the URL that represents the opened up endpoint. Uh, but we'll check also that things are working, both that, the op that it really is an opened up endpoint, and therefore that it works. The NetCDF library didn't complain. But we'll also use this grid geo package that Felipe can say more about that basically reads the uh, uh, parts of the data only to create a mask, a spatial mask, and a bounding box, spatial bounding box um, of the model domain. Um, and some of those don't um, give appropriate results. Um, so here you see that we got four out of the original, what, five or nine, I forget. Um, and now we'll do pretty much the same thing we did before. We'll map the bounding box, the domains rather, on Folium. Um, while also mapping the uh, um, bounding box for the Pioneer Array in this case. So as before, that's in red. Um, and oops, those are the two domains that we got from these models. In reality, it's four, but two of those, there are two pairs here. Uh, and you can click on it, and you, you'll get a uh, pop-up for the bigger bounding box. Now we'll um, suck in one of those models and just do a very simple plot using X-Array, already talked about. Um, so we'll pick one of those um, service endpoints and uh, read it in very easily. Just pass the URL that has been confirmed to be a working open app. And just like uh, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick did, um, you can list the data set and uh, model, uh, so essentially the NetCDF file, model, um, the NetCDF file for a model output can be really complex and pretty big. But if that's what you're interested in, there it is. Uh, lots of metadata and lots of results. I'm going to focus on salinity. So there is the salt variable and its uh, metadata and its structure. And I'm uh, exploring a bit its uh, coordinates, S row. Um, again, this is a model. So it takes some uh, additional thinking or knowledge to understand um, what each of these variables are and map them into real world coordinates. Um, the runtime. Time um, and uh, in order to do a simple map plot, I'm going to make a very simple selection using X-Array mechanisms. Basically, the most recent time 
and the uh, first escrow, which is kind of death or pressure. And first, I'm going to do a super simple X-ray uh, mass plot. Uh, that the advantage is that it's super simple. It's only plot, pretty much. Um, the disadvantage is that the uh, axes are not real world coordinates. They are model coordinates. Um, and if you recall, this model, I should have pointed that out, oops, is rotated. Yeah. It's that blue box. That blue rotated box. So um, it doesn't correspond to the reality you expect directly. So we took the next step. Thanks to Felicen, we start to pi to apply um, the expected projections and map the x and y axis to the uh, its own um, mappings, long row and lat row, to get a map that looks much more real. Um, but it was still fairly easy to do. And there it is. And again, don't worry if you're not following every single step. This is a resource that you can go back to. I'm going to end with um, um, something conceptually very similar, but uh, instead of doing uh, targeting the uh, IUS catalog, we'll be hitting the um, click. We'll be hitting the glider DAC AirDAP uh, instance. Our AirDAP is um, it is well. Some people would say it is the answer. Period. Um, I take uh, I take a more nuanced view, but it, it is a Swiss Army knife. Uh, it can be a catalog. Um, it can return data in all sorts of formats or plots. Um, so here we'll be interacting with the AirDAP instance, both at, as the catalog and as the source of the data and the source of the endpoints. Um, again, there's a lot of um, um, background info here that hopefully you'll find useful. But uh, again, conceptually, it will be similar to what we've done. We have to define um, our query parameters. First is the bounding box, and we'll be doing this on the endurance array again. Um, so this code is pretty much the same we did before. Uh, we are taking advantage of uh, one of the really nifty things about AirDAP. It's, it's both a user application, so you go and uh, click your way around uh, getting results, but it also helps you learn the API, because the API is really uh, URLs. Um, but those URLs can get pretty complex. Um, so Felipe wrote a, a helper uh, package, a nifty helper package called AirDAPI, that helps construct those um, URLs, uh, so it makes it easier to interact with the AirDAP API, uh, the URL-based API. So we're using AirDAPI here. Um, you can see here we instantiate um, an AirDAPI object. We pass to the server, and we're doing the table DAP protocol. Um, um, from that, we can get, um, we can do a search for everything that has a, a CSV response, construct the URL, and then pass it to a pandas, and get back a pandas data frame. Lots of things going on in one step. 480 records, that's pretty much everything in the AirDAP instance. We don't want everything. We only want uh, the uh, endurance array because we only care about the Pacific Northwest. And you should too. Um, <laughs> so OK, now we'll narrow it down. We don't want everything. We just want uh, the uh, endurance array um, spatial domain, only gliders that have seawater temperature as the standard name, and a specific time window that I picked. Um, it's basically from it's 2515 and 2616. Uh, now we'll issue uh, a, a query that has those additional criteria. And again, uh, with AirDAPI, we can we construct the URL in a simple way, pass it to, uh, to Pandas read CSV, which can do all the magic. And then here we get a dump of the data set ID. Uh, we get 30 back. Um, now, you can't see this here, but all the ones that say CE are OOI gliders. Um, and the rest, which is really three or four, in reality it's three, but it's four items are from NAMI. Uh, and you'll see this in a bit. Um, so we'll look at the unique, in this um, initial sort of catalog level results give you some catalog level information. One of them is the institutions. So to do a sum, it's in pandas, um, to do a summary of institutions associated with this um, data sets, glider data sets, and you can see OI. 26 um, records, Applied Physics Lab, three records, um, and Oregon State University is one record. One record here is uh, essentially a deployment, the way the glider that functions is. It's a deployment. And the glider, so you may have a glider that's been in the water, generally speaking, for five years, but if it's broken up into 10 deployments, then it'll be 10 records. Um, then we can take a, uh, another, a, a broader look at the um, what's available in that, um, 
what we get back. Some of this is useful and some of it is not so useful. Oops, I don't know what happened to the uh, um, scroll bar, but there's, there are more columns here. Somehow they're not visible. Um, one thing that I'll point out, it's a subtlety, but um, when dealing with the glider deck, it can be handy. Uh, the glider deck often aggregates uh, data sets from a single provider using a common convention. This all nanis-uw gliders basically are data sets submitted by the uh, uh, nanis-uw provider, which sort of means or nanis, or one aspect of nanis. Um, so it's really redundant because uh, it's, um, it can be pretty convenient in certain circumstances, but in this case, it's the combination of these two SG uh, records. So what I'm going to do uh, to reduce the um, duplication and the amount of data that will pull down, I'm going to eliminate all the records that, uh, or drop out the records that start with all. The data set ID that starts with all. Now, just like I did before, I'm going to focus on one data set and drill in a little bit just to give you a flavor of what, what it looks like. So I'm going to pick an um, OI data set, um, bring it in, create the URL, pass it as a data set ID, CSV, pass it to Pandas data frame. Uh, now we have Pandas witness. Um, and here is the, all the um, um, variables and attributes that are found basically in the NetPDF file. Uh, and this is just a small subset, a very small subset. Um, this is uh, a, a summary of the uh, type of the variable names and what kind of uh, row types that are associated with, basically whether they are variables or attributes. The sense of what is included. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on the next three things, but basically there are conveniences that Odapi provides or um, uh, that uh, uh, get around some of Erdat's rough edges in its API uh, and, and make it simpler to interact and can access. Um, okay, now we're going to uh, go back to the broader query for that whole endurance array region and that two year period. and uh, Pull in, um, let's see. oh no, sorry. Before doing that, we're still dealing with this one data set. We're going to define, we're defining what data we're going to download, the access basically, as well as salinity and temperature, um, and issue a query to get all that data uh, so that you can interact with it. Um, this is just an example of what it would look like if you wanted a MATLAB file. Um, you can, um, Adapi provides a, a convenient function to auto transform it into a pandas data frame. Uh, but it also does that for X-Array, and I find the X-Array convenience function function much more useful because the X-Array can be rich with metadata. What you bring in brings all that NetCDF metadata uh, goodness that a uh, Pandas data frame doesn't have. So I'm going to choose to download it as a, a um, X-Array data set, and there it is, the X-Array data set, rich with meta CF metadata and HDDD uh, metadata discovery. There's the temperature variable. Um, now I'm going to convert that to a data frame, um, the temperature uh, data set to a data frame for convenience. Um, and that's what it looks like as a simple data frame. Uh, and now we're going to plot uh, sort of a naive plot uh, as a scatter plot from the data frame um, of temperature with um, date on the uh, x-axis and depth on the y-axis. Keep in mind that if you're trying to write a nature paper out of this plot, that this um, this is not, this is time, not space. So this time, in the, uh, the glider could be making lots of loops all along that y x-axis. It takes more effort to plot um, uh, a convenient uh, plot with uh, appropriate spatial um, axis. But the main point is that that wasn't a lot of work to pull in this data set and be able to plot something uh, with meaningful information. Um, okay, now we're going to get a, um, we were not looking at any spatial aspect of that. So here's a very simple map uh, of uh, just using GeoPandas goodness um, of what that um, glider track looks like. That blue uh, squiggle uh, in that map is the uh, overall glider track, um, where red is our, is our uh, endurance array uh, bounding box. So now we're going to go back to the larger uh, query um, and uh, bring in not all the data, because that's way too much. We'll be still be waiting, or we might make the glider deck unhappy with us, I guess. Like you always, when you're dealing with distributed systems, you do have to be conscious about both your own waiting and what you're doing to the other system. So here, we, I only want to plot tracks. 
I'm not going to bring in data, like the linear the temp part. I just want to know where they are, roughly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pass the same time filter, but I'm only going to get back latitude and longitude. Um, again, because I know that I only want tracks. Um, so here's some um, convenience uh, to uh, do the processing. Um, then convert it into a data frame and ultimately into a geodata frame because I love geodata frames. Um, uh, and there they are. We have point, latitude, longitude, glider IDs, and the uh, um, geometry or spatial data type. Um, this, uh, once you have a geodata frame, you can do kind of normal data frame magic. Um, this just gives you the number of values per data set. Um, okay, so now we're going to create a simple, a nice plot. Um, Doing some, some staging with uh, for nice color map and the foliam again. Um, auto create the scent choice for foliam. Um, here is the um, the uh, bounding box again for endurance array, and here's the magic for the uh, um, all the tracks using different colors and uh, joining the points to create a line. Um, and there's now our interactive map with all the data that met the criteria. Um, Play with it. It uh, has pop-ups. Uh, when I click on it, I added both the data set ID as well as the provider. So we can see whether it's OI and oh, it's one of ours, or it's Nanus, oh, it's not one of ours, or the other way around. Um, the nice thing, again, since this um, glider DAC originally developed with support from IUS, and now uh, it's becoming a resource for the wider community with OI submitting data to the glider data to the o, to the glider DAC. It, it becomes a terrific uh, central point for access to glider data, regardless of the source. Um, just fantastic. Um, I think I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. On time. My God. Questions? I'm sure someone has questions or head scratchers. But I mean, please ask questions. But again, uh, the idea is that. Uh, bug us. Anyone here? Um, please? There's what, sorry? Yes, there's a glider DAC format. <laughs> there's a format and specific set of metadata um, patterns uh, that, yes, they are CF conventions and ACDD, but also a little further than that, and documentation about uh, what it should look like. Um, the compliance checker helps. I mean, right? Um, yeah. Ultimately, I mean, let, let's check n not to uh, uh, belittle what is it, the um, spray gliders, but let's say it's locum and sea gliders. They, they come in different, the raw formats are different. I know more about sea gliders. They are a particular NetCDF um, format. Um, so you ultimately have to map it from that format into the glider DAC NetCDF format and structure and that metadata. The uh, nice thing, and that's where I, I think the IS community has created a nice um, community, really, that uh, there is a, a, a Google group called IUS Tech um, that uh, started with IUS but is completely open. Um, the process of converting from the Sea Glider, in other words, from a widely uh, used format, the Sea Glider NetCDF to the Glider DAC format, is something that lots of people have done. So, you know, we all want to re avoid reinventing the wheels. So, that's one way to start posing a question that, uh, well, either contacting the Glider DAC and/or uh, posing a question to that list to say, hey, have you written a Python? A script to convert from P files, C Glider P files, into Glider DAC formats, and I bet you'll get an answer. And it may get you 95% of the way. You'll still have to make hard decisions about, uh, because all this metadata gets tricky. Who contributors? Who is the creator? Who is the owner? And then you know, I talk to my PI. Is he going to be mad at me if I don't say he's the creator? Uh, but still. The compliance checker, I believe she can correct me, uh, has a specific setting for glider DAC files, right? Yeah. Or plugin, yeah. something like that.
assume the microphone is on. So when uh, we're setting up, um, I would 